another day. What should I do today? Should I get washed up? Should I take a shower? I'm waiting. Is God gonna tell me what to do? Is there a direction for my TV clothes? How long should I wash my hands for? How do I even answer, answer this question? Is it even worth washing my hands like this? What should I eat for breakfast? Does God even care about me? This is good for me. Should I wait or should I make a decision? Where is God leading me right now? What is? Where is God in all this? I wonder where where is God in all my struggles? Is God? What do I do when I'm not there? there right? I'm, so I'm not okay. Doing more is that okay? Do I don't know what to do. What do I do when I don't know what to do? Good morning, Pearl River, and welcome to worship online this morning. We're so glad that all of you are able to join us virtually today as we celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ like we do every Sunday. Uh, just a couple of notes uh, before we get started this morning. The first is that we are continuing to collect non-perishable food items in uh, the handicap access uh handicap accessible entrance to the church right up the driveway there's a clear bin where you can place your food and all of that will get distributed between saint stephen's food cupboard and people to people it's an opportunity for us to be able to help those uh, who are really in need in this time Additionally, if you're far away or if you'd rather donate monetarily, we have a website, uh, pearlriverumc.com slash walk, that will allow you to be able to donate online, and all of the money that we raise during this time will be uh, sent for COVID relief to our local food pantries as we try and help them overcome the large spike in clients that they have gotten. So I invite you to be a part of that. If you've not yet done your prayer walk, I invite you to do so. I invite you to grab folks who you live with and be socially distant as you walk and you pray for all of those who are on the front lines of COVID, all of those who are struggling, all of those who have died and their families that grieve them, uh, and just an opportunity for us to be intentional about continuing to walk and to be in prayer. 
Additionally, I'd like to remind you all that we have a Bible study every Monday night at 7 p.m. If you're interested in joining that, let us know in the comment section, in the chat section uh, to the left of your screen, and we will get you all hooked up in that. We're also in the process of discerning out whether or not people would be interested in a Thursday morning Bible study. If 7 o'clock on Monday nights doesn't work, maybe a Thursday will. Let us know if you'd like to join in that as well. To let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning, I invite you to text WELCOME to the number that's on your screen or to fill out the online Connect card, uh, which should be linked in the left of your screen in the chat bar. Let us know who's worshiping with you uh, as we prepare to be able to connect with one another digitally. So on that note, let's get started with worship for this morning. Good morning, my name is Pamela Gunning. I'm the reader for today. Let's rise for the call to worship. Let us rejoice in the God of our salvation, to whom we turn in times of joy and times of sorrow. Let us not be afraid to be real and honest before God in the community of faith. Restore us, O oh Lord. Our opening prayer. God of understanding, we gather today, together today as people who go through ups and downs in life. We confess that in difficult times, we often close ourselves off to you and to one another. May we turn to you in our need, confident in your ability to handle all we bring to you. Help us to be a supportive community to one another so that we can accept the present as we step into a future filled with your hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Welcome to Church Online. Are you guys tired of doing stuff online yet? I kind of am, but we do what we have to do because our goal and our job is to help keep people safe. Now, I know that you're all probably experiencing a lot of different feelings lately, especially now that New York has officially said that there's no more in-person school for the rest of the year. It's got to be really hard to take. You won't be able to say goodbye to your friends or to your families, or your teachers. Um, you won't be able to say goodbye to uh, you know, their, your other aides and the people who help make school so important. And I know especially for those of you who are moving on from one school to another, that's even harder. So today what I want to talk to you about, because I'm going to be talking about it to, with the grown-ups, is that it's okay to not feel great all the time. Uh, and it is an okay thing for you to have all of the feelings that you're having. I know sometimes we want to believe that um, we have to be happy all the time or that we're not allowed to be sad. Uh, and there's a lot of stories in the Bible that tell us that that's not so true. So today you're going to hear the story of Ruth and Naomi. And Ruth and Naomi were family because Ruth married Naomi's son. But then he died. And Naomi wanted to send Ruth back to her family. And Naomi was very, very sad. But she wanted Ruth to have an opportunity to go back and be with her family, even though Naomi was going to be alone. And Ruth said to Naomi, I will stay with you. And Naomi started to tell everybody that she was sad and that she was unhappy and that her heart hurt. That's a really important lesson for all of us to know, that it's okay to feel sad. It's okay that your heart hurts. It's okay to have emotions that are not always happy. What's most important to remember is that Naomi still had Ruth and she still had God. So even though her heart hurt and she was sad and she missed her sons and she missed her husband and she missed her family, she still had Ruth who chose her above everything else and she still had God. Naomi was able to say how she was feeling and to hold on to how she was feeling and still be able to move on with her life. So I know that there's a lot of feelings that you all are having right now, and it can be really hard to feel your feelings, but I want you to feel them. I want you to feel sad when you're sad, and you're, when your heart hurts, I want you to feel that, and when you're happy, I want you to be happy, but I want you to remember that there's always good things that come after bad. So even when we know that we're sad and that we are upset and that we are worried, something good always comes. So it's important for us to be able to say, this is what I'm feeling. And it's important for us to be able to tell our parents and our grandparents and our friends, this is what I'm feeling. And then we let them help, right? So Naomi says to Ruth, my heart hurts. And I want you to go back because I don't want to ruin your life, but I'm very sad. And because she told Ruth how she was feeling, Ruth was able to help Naomi to find uh, more good things in life, right? And Ruth and Naomi wind up having a really great life together. And Ruth and Naomi become a part of Jesus's lineage. So Ruth and Naomi are on Jesus's family tree. There's always good stuff that comes even when we're sad. So this week, I want you to practice naming your emotions, okay? So if you're feeling sad, say you're sad. If you're feeling happy, say you're happy. If you're feeling worried, say you're worried. If you don't want to say them or if you don't know how to say them, draw them out or color them out or do whatever it is that you can to let people know what you're feeling so that they can help you to feel better. Sometimes it takes a long time for us to feel better. Sometimes we're sad about things for a long time, but that's okay. It's okay to feel all of the things that you are feeling as long as you remember that there's always good that comes after it. 
Just like if you drive through a tunnel and it's really dark, there's always light on the other side. So I promise that even though we're sad about the fact that there's no more school for this year, and we're sad about not being able to see our friends, and we're sad about not being able to say goodbye to our teachers, we know that one day this will be over and we will get to love on our family and see our friends and meet new teachers and all of that will help us feel even better. So while you're feeling all your feels, also remember that there are good things to come, especially when we don't always see them. Like my favorite line from the Harry Potter series, I know some of you are reading it, is that uh, there is, oh, you can always find light in the darkness as long as somebody remembers to, remembers to turn on the light. And Professor Dumbledore says that, right? So even when it feels really sad, if you can say it and turn on a happy light, you'll remember that there is good in everything. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being our light. Help us to feel our feelings and know that you are with us. Help us, God, to see you in everything we do. Help us to have faith and to be strong and help us to get through all of the emotions that we are feeling uh, quickly and may there be an end to go COVID soon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Old Testament reading today is from Ruth chapter 1, verses 11 through 21. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. When, where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and even more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on till they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? God's word for us. The story of Ruth and Naomi, uh, we often stop it at the where you go, I will go, where you stay, I will stay. 
because we want to laud Ruth as this incredible woman who gives up um, the opportunity to go back to her family uh, and in order to stay with her mother-in-law um, as being the most important part of that story. And don't get me wrong, uh, it's a hugely important part. It says to us a lot about who Ruth is and how we can strive to be more concerned with the people that we love versus what's best for us. But I think for me, especially in this time, the most important part of this narrative is Naomi's claim of who she is and how she feels. We live in a society in which we are supposed to be good all the time. In which when we ask the question, how are you doing? You always respond with, I'm good or I'm fine. Because we know that the question is not an actual uh, desiring to know of what our state is, but is instead just a nicety that we exchange. In fact, so many of us are so terrified to talk about what's really going on in our minds and our hearts that we just clam up and we use the age old, I'm fine. And we never name when we're not okay. And here, Naomi is lamenting over and over and over again, I am not okay. This is not okay. None of what is happening to me is okay. And girls, none of this is okay for you either. Naomi has a lost not only her husband, but her sons. And if in this day and age when Naomi and Ruth and Orpah are... Um, experiencing life, you were nothing without a husband. No one owed you anything. No one was obligated to care for you. You could not own your own property. You could not make your own living. There was nothing for you. So Naomi tries to do what she thinks is best for Orpah and Ruth by sending them home because they're still young and there's still an opportunity where they may marry someone else. They may have a chance to be a second wife um, or somebody may find them uh, marketable to be a spouse. The tradition in Ruth and Naomi's day was that um, you, if you married into a family, then you uh, if your partner died, if your husband died, then you could marry a younger brother uh, and continue the line that way. But Naomi says to the girls, I <laughs> am not having any more children. I'm far too old to have someone want to marry me again. And even if he did and I were to bear children, would you wait for them? God has taken everything from me. And I do not wish for God to take everything from you. I am not okay. This is not okay. So often I have found, particularly in the Christian church, that you fake it till you make it. Right? We don't talk about how people actually are. We don't talk about what's eating away at us. We don't talk about what's going on in our lives. Instead, we just go with the I'm fine. I'm good. Things are good. Yeah, it doesn't matter that we're in the middle of a pandemic. It doesn't matter that I'm frustrated with my spouse. It doesn't matter that my kids are driving me up the wall. It doesn't matter that I'm concerned about my finances. It doesn't matter that I'm living in a sense of anxiety that I have never experienced before because I am convinced that somebody in my family is going to die from COVID. No, no, I'm good. Things are great. Yeah, the kids are wonderful. The spouse is lovely. I'm, I'm not worried about anything. I have found more in Christian circles than anywhere else, this deep need to be fine. And if you're anything other than fine, you might as well slap a Band-Aid on it or whitewash it so that you look fine. 
And I will tell you as a person who grew up with that and a person who lived in that and a person who is a part of that system now, it's complete and utter malarkey. God doesn't call us to be fine. God doesn't call us to lie about what's going on. God doesn't call us to be a community of Stepford women and men who all get along in the same way and everybody is perfectly okay. It's not who we were created to be. It's not what we were created to do. Instead, instead, we are called to say when we are not okay. We are called to be like Naomi and to own our stuff. See, I think the, the, the issue becomes, um, as Christians, right, we have this weird belief that because we follow Jesus that everything's going to work out perfectly for us. That we're going to live and exist in a space in which everything is great all the time. And we are so afraid of how the person sitting in the pew next to us or in front of us or behind us or the person standing in the pulpit is going to judge us. It's a lot easier for us to just say, I'm fine. And all that continues to lead us into is this shame spiral that brings us absolutely nowhere except cowering in the darkness of our own fears, our own worries, our own anxieties, and overwhelmed with the incredible pressure of trying to be okay when you are anything but okay. Shame, guilt, is what keeps us from grace. Shame and guilt come from not feeling like we have a right or an ability to safely say, I am not okay. I remember the first time that I had to admit to myself that I was not okay. When I was a junior in high school, my best friend tried to kill herself. And uh, it was horrifying and overwhelming and was spiraling me into a place I didn't want to admit I was spiraling into. My Boyfriend of several years who I really thought I was going to marry had just gotten somebody else pregnant and broke it up with me. My best friend uh, went through a very, very dark period in her own life. And while she's still with us, which is great, it was a long road of navigating through not being okay. And where I was in my life was um, I was the person in my dorm who everybody came to my room and I had this futon, uh, a black futon that my parents had gotten for me. Um, And it was known as uh, the couch. You know, like uh, in therapy uh, on TV and in movies where people lay on the couch like this, right? And they talk about their problems and they're like, yes, I'm just going to lay here and tell you all of my feelings. Well, that was my futon for every person in my dorm. And I lived with 71 other people. And every person came to me and wanted my advice or wanted to be able to talk. And I was the first person to come up with coloring it out. Very shortly thereafter, after uh, adult coloring books came out, just saying, I started that trend. Um, And we had lots of other stuff that was going on in our dorm at the time uh, with people that I was working with and, and just the stuff of life. And it was then that I started to realize how not okay I was. How not together I was. How I was so busy trying to fix everybody else's problems And I was so concerned with trying to tie up everybody's loose ends that at night, 
I would stare in the mirror that hung in my dorm room and spiral. And I was the good Christian girl who knew she was being called to be a pastor, who knew that um, I was headed down uh, a life path in which I was gonna deal with lots of people's problems. And that thing that kept nagging at the back of my head that said, if you weren't good enough for the boy, how are you ever gonna be good enough for anybody else? If you weren't good enough to keep everything, all of the spinning plates that you had spinning, how are you ever gonna make it in ministry? And if you couldn't prevent your friend from trying to take her own life, what good were you gonna be? How are you ever gonna stand in front of a congregation? How are you ever gonna give pastoral care? And I spiraled into this very real sense of absolutely, positively loathing myself. And it took me months and months and months to be able to say to somebody, I'm not okay. Because I was so afraid of the judgment that I was going to get from the people around me that I would rather live with my shame spiral than talk about how I wasn't okay and not being okay, right, from the good Christian girl who had her life all together, right, who was at Smith and worked three jobs and was the um, president of the tour guides and I was in charge of keeping everything together. And on the outside, I looked perfectly all figured out showed up to my classes, I ran my boards, um, but inside I was not okay and I didn't think that I could tell anybody that I wasn't okay. Because I was afraid if I told someone, judgments wouldn't stop. And it wasn't until I very nearly hit rock bottom that I wandered into the downstairs of our chapel at Smith and sat in the office of um, our spiritual director and looked at Matilda and said, I'm not okay. And I don't know how to be not okay. And she listened and she held space and she helped me learn to not be okay. It was a complete and total reshifting of what I thought life was supposed to be about. She helped me work and navigate through the weird way that my brain processes things and the strange way in which the faith that I held so dearly was also part of an institution that didn't want us to talk about our stuff for fear of what it would bring. No, you always have to be okay. And my question then and now continues to be like, why? Why do we have to be okay? What is it in the gospels and in the journey that God gives to us in scripture that tells us that we like have to be okay, that it's our job to be okay? There is nothing in all of scripture that tells us that we are required to be okay. In fact, what we see time and time and time and time again in the midst of scripture is that nobody is okay. And Naomi is one of the only characters in the whole Bible to be able to say, I'm really not good. I'm like, a, not, this is not okay. I'm not doing okay. Ladies, I don't want to ruin your lives. So you can go be, find a way to be okay. But I'm not doing so hot. And Naomi sits with it and allows people to come alongside of her and carry her. Ruth comes alongside of Naomi 
and carries her in her not okayness. And together, together, they forge a life that is more than okay. That is more than what we expected. That is more than what in that moment, in those moments of not okayness that Naomi ever thought was possible. But she would not have gotten there if Ruth didn't help her. And she wouldn't have gotten there if she didn't find a way to be able to say, I'm really not so good. We live in a time and a place that is so focused on presenting a good front to the rest of the world, and it is killing us. It is killing us because we don't know how to turn to one another and say, I'm not okay, can you help carry me? I'm not okay. Can you help me see the work of the Lord in all of this? I'm not okay. Could you just sit with me for a moment? Because the more that we try and, sh- and shove the not okayness down, the darker we become and the further away from God we are. Because then we begin to think that God is like the people we assume are sitting in our pews. We begin to think that if they can't handle our not okayness, then no one, especially not God, can handle our not okayness. When in reality, all God is asking from each and every one of us is the fullness of who we are, the okay and the not okay. All God is asking for us is for an opportunity to reach into our not okayness and sit with us. There have been many more times since my junior year of college in which I have been not okay. There have been many more times in which I have had to pray for the strength to go to the therapy that I need to go to. Pray for the strength to be able to get up in front of a congregation and say, hey, I'm not okay. And I've not been okay before. And there will be times in the future when I'm not okay again. And that not okayness doesn't diminish my worthiness as a person. In the same way, that your not okayness does not diminish your worthiness or the amount that God loves you or your belonging in this place. My biggest dream for the church is that we become a place in which every person can stand up and say, This is my stuff. Where I can say, Hi, my name is Gabrielle. I suffer from body dysmorphic disorder. I have an eating disorder. Uh, Most of the time, I like am running on a pretty general uh, medium to high anxiety level, but like I do this all the time anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm managing it. I also love Star Wars and Harry Potter, and I love to laugh, and I love to read, and I love to take my dog for a walk downtown and to take him to the dog park, and I am so much more than those other things that are not okay, but they're a part of who I am, and they're important parts of me, and this is all that I have, and all that I am, and I know God loves me because of all of the things that make me who I am, so that you can feel safe and secure standing up and saying, hi, my name is so-and-so, and here's my stuff. And so that we can name our stuff so that our stuff, A, stops becoming such a singular experience. Um, Because so often we hold on to these beliefs that I'm the only one who's ever experienced this thing before. 
right? So often we uh, put ourselves in a shame spiral that say, says nobody else has ever experienced this before. I, I'm the only one, right? So it allows us to be able to connect with one another. And two, it helps us to see that we are so much more than the things that make us not okay. And the things that make us not okay are just as much a part of our story as the profound and beautiful things that happen uh, in our everyday lives. I would not be me if I didn't have my stuff. And my stuff has helped me to see the world and other people in different ways. And so it is my dream to be able to see the church get up and be able to name it, to be able to hold it together, and to be able to celebrate the ways that God works in the midst of all of our brokenness. There is not one person, save for Jesus Christ himself, who has walked the face of this earth, who is perfect. Story after story after story in the scripture is mention and um, tales of people who do not get it right, who carry their shame around with them, their stuff around with them, and God uses even them. King David is lauded as one of um, Israel's greatest kings. And yet, you all remember the story of Bathsheba, right? If you don't, listen to the song later. (laughs) That, That David sees Bathsheba bathing and wants her and takes her as his wife and has her husband killed because he can't handle the guilt and the shame of that. Peter, the one upon whom the rock of the church, the church is built upon, the rock of the church, Peter, right? He always messes things up. He always gets it wrong. Today is also Mother's Day. And it's a complicated day for a lot of people. Some people carry the weight of this holiday around and they're not okay. And we have not given them space to not be okay. If God can take David and God can take Abraham and God can take Moses and Peter and God can take Paul, God can take Naomi and Ruth and weave together a story and a life that is profound and beautiful and incredible What more can God do for us? It is okay to not be okay. It's when we lean on one another and we lean on God. Not for judgment, not for punishment, but for fullness of life and the chance to say me too. It is my firm belief that as we all sit in our stuff, the more we share the darkest, scariest, most unbelievable parts of who we are, our community grows stronger. Our faith grows exponentially and we truly become rooted in the grace that God extends to us as we extend it to all of those who are with us. So wherever you are today, wherever you have been in your life, I hope you again hear these words that it is okay to not be okay. God loves you. This church loves you. I love you. And the best part of God is that there is no darkness that God cannot shine light on. There is no shame that God cannot extend grace to. There is no place that you can hide where God is not already wrapping you up in God's arms and whispering, 
it's okay. I am here. Feel your feels. And let us begin our journey to the life I have always had prepared for you. Today and every day. Amen.
Friends, as we um, join together in a time of corporate prayer, I invite you to text prayer to the number on your screen. Um, and feel free at any point today or during the week to send that in. We're in the process of developing a prayer list, um, and we uh, pr- have a prayer team that meets every Wednesday that prays over that. So let us know where you're in need this week, and we would love to pray for you. So just some things that I want to name as we move forward in our time of prayer. Today is Mother's Day, right? And we give thanks for all of the different ways that mothers have changed our lives. Sometimes we've had really, really good relationships with our moms, and they have brought such joy and peace and life into our lives. Sometimes we don't have great relationships with our moms, and that makes today even harder. Some of us are not mothers and have always wanted to be mothers. Some of us are mothers, but our children are no longer with us. Some of us struggle every day to figure out what it means to be a mother figure without having children of our own. Some of us are estranged from our children and are navigating through what it means to live with that. For some people, today is not as happy and wonderful as it is for others. So as we pray today, I invite you, no matter what your feelings are on this day, to be in prayer for all of those who experience this day differently. Let us pray. O holy, gracious, and eternal God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day, this Sunday, this opportunity to be able to worship you. We give you thanks, God, for the technology that allows us to be able to be together even when we are apart. God, we pray for all of those who are experiencing today differently than perhaps the Hallmark Company wants us to. For all of the moms and daughters and sons out there who have great relationships, we give you thanks. For all of those who are missing their children and for children who are missing their mother, we pray for your comfort. For all of those who are navigating out motherhood and being a mothering figure, we pray for your wisdom and grace to surround them. For all of those who are tired of hearing questions about their motherhood or potential motherhood for those who have longed for children and do not have them for those whose children are no longer with them for those who approach this day in the secular world with great pain and hurt and heartache we pray for your comfort and for a reminder that you are with us even in that. God, for all of those who are on the front lines of this horrific pandemic, we pray for safety and for protection. For all of those, God, who are afraid and worried, for all of those who are grieving, for all of those who are sick and shut in, pray for your grace and your mercy and your love. For all of those everywhere, God, who are struggling, who are concerned about where their next meal will come from, who are worried about how they will pay the rent, who are concerned about what comes next, God, I pray for your grace and for a faith to trust in you in and through all things. Lord, we offer all of these things up to you with the words that your son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Uh, my friends, as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings, I want to share with you all a little bit about Jesus on tithing. So sometimes people get uncomfortable when the subject of money is brought up in church. I know, I see it, I feel it. It's an unfortunate awkwardness, and it comes from when we question whether finances and spirituality should be brought up in the same space and the same time. But when it comes to giving, the Bible has a lot to say. The command to tithe or to give 10% of our income gets multiple mentions throughout scripture. There are instructions concerning the command itself and also promises spelled out for those who follow it. Many of the verses are in the Old Testament and invariably people want to know what Jesus has to say about tithing in the New Testament. In Luke 11, Jesus uh, is confronting the Pharisees, or what we might view as those legalistic good Christians back in his day. And he says, what sorrows await you, Pharisees? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the most important things. This brief statement confirms that yes, finances and spirituality do coexist. Jesus specifically instructs us to tithe. We are told that there are more important things, yes, but really if we ignore justice and the love of God, then we are not going to get even we are not even going to get to the other important areas of our lives that Jesus wants to transform. Isn't it interesting that Jesus even brings tithing into the same discussion as justice and our love for God? Yet it makes sense. If you consider that these three are areas that have huge impact on the way that we live. Ignoring justice would be speaking to how we relate to one another. The love of God speaks to our understanding of and how we relate to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and to God the Father. And tithing speaks to the way that we relate to our finances. Now, I understand that during this time in particular, there's a lot of people who are facing job loss and other financial hardships there is also an opportunity for growth here. No matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, these areas affect us daily. Jesus is clear on how we should relate to uh, each other, to God, and to our finances. Be just in your dealings with others. Love God with all of your heart and put him first in your finances. We thank you for all of your continued faithfulness in all of these areas. When you're just in your dealing, dealings with others, it's an honor to serve alongside of you as you graciously love and serve your neighbors. When you love God with all of your heart, you're a light to a lost and dying world. When you tithe, you help support the church's ministry. We especially want to thank those of you who have continued to give during this time. Your consistency and faithfulness are a huge blessing to our community. The easiest way for you to give online right now is at pearlriverumc.com slash invest. If you have any questions about setting up digital giving or recurring giving, please contact Chris Stewart, our financial secretary. And if you find yourself in need during this time, please do not hesitate to reach out and let us know. We want to be able to serve you and to help you. May God bless you as you give. Let us pray. O oh, holy, gracious, and eternal God, we know that everything that we have comes from you. God, we just pray that you would bless and accept the gifts that are given in your honor to this place, that they might go to build your kingdom here 
and everywhere. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, as you exit out of the screen or close your laptops or turn church off of your uh, TV screens, I invite you to do so with a renewed sense of peace, of hope, of joy. Even in the midst of not being okay, God is with you. May you find places this week that remind you of how deeply God loves you and how God is there for you always. 
May you look for the good, find the joy, and rest in the God who promises to be with you and surround you no matter what. May you go in peace, in hope, in love, and in joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.